Friends, I'm Homi Baba of the Mahindra Humanities Center, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Norton Lectures, Harvard's singular tribute to the most creative minds in the arts and humanities. <coughs> Even on such occasions, it is rare to welcome a figure as pioneering and protein as Herbie Hancock, the 2014 Charles Eliot Norton Professor of Poetry. I want to thank my dear colleagues on the Norton Committee, Hia Chernowin, Ingrid Monson, Carol Oja, Martin Puchner, Alex Redding, Ann Scheffler, and David Schiff for bringing us to this remarkable conclusion. Herbie Hancock's presence here today establishes a landmark in the history of these lectures. Despite the series' rich heritage of composers and musicians, including Stravinsky, Bernstein, and John Cage, Professor Hancock's Norton Lectures are the first to reflect on the history and the ethics of jazz. What also makes this occasion a historic milestone is that Herbie Hancock is the first African-American Norton professor. His unsurpassed contribution to the history of music has revolutionized um, our conscious, civic consciousness and our aesthetic and spiritual aspirations. It would be no exaggeration to say that Herbie Hancock has defined cultural innovation in each decade of the last half century. The rich landscape that these lectures promise from the wisdom of Miles Davis to cultural diplomacy and the voice of freedom were apparent to me from my first conversation with Professor Hancock. I was on the phone to him in Bombay and he was in Los Angeles. Sure, I'm a musician, he said, but you know, I have many other interests too. It is difficult indeed to observe Herbie Hancock's career without marveling at his ability to direct his musical genius across an extraordinary array of genres, collaborations, and cultural institutions. In the musical field alone, he has ventured from post-bop to hip-hop, funk to film soundtracks, Miles Davis to Joni Mitchell, Lang Lang to Pink. In a world less happy and harmonious, he has committed himself to causes ranging from world peace to pediatric AIDS, and his capacity as a UNESCO goodwill ambassador, he has established International Jazz Day, which brings together communities, schools, artists, historians, academics, and jazz enthusiasts all over the world to raise awareness of the need for intercultural dialogue, mutual understanding, and social transformation. It is in the light of his capacious commitments and activities that we get a sense of what awaits us in his exploration of what he has called the ethics of jazz. One particular aspect of his ethical temperament makes his presence crucial to the life of the university. In several of his remarks on the ambivalent fate of the global world, I have detected a profound dedication to the practice of collaboration. Collaboration on a transnational scale, collaboration on the scale of the musical ensemble, collaboration as a family of people, religious collaboration, collaboration in spiritual terms, and collaboration devoted to social and cultural justice. If we don't want globalization to be what we don't want it to be, he has said, why don't we create the globalization that we want? <laughs> Collaboration for Professor Hancock 
goes beyond enlightened self-interest. From his work, we learn that what is crucial to our global survival within the academy, in civil society, is an ethic and an aesthetic of neighborliness that allows us to collaborate across the diverse and disjunctive terrains of a world that is in some aspects synchronized and simultaneous, while in other respects dramatically out of sync with itself and others. Successful collaboration depends upon the ability to learn together rather than to take a prescriptive and censorious attitude. Respecting one's neighbors requires that you work and play with them. Jazz is the moment, Herbie Hancock tells us, and it's non-judgmental. When you're playing on the stage, you're not judging what the other musician plays. What you have in mind is to be able to enhance it. Whatever a musician plays, your job and your desire is to be able to help it to blossom. There's a sense of mutual cooperation. Those values are not only wonderful values to have for the creation of music, they are wonderful values to have for daily life. There is, I bet, no single person in this room today whose daily life has not been enlivened by the sheer soulfulness of Cantaloupe Island. Nobody whose nights have not been drawn into the early dawn by the melancholic strains of maiden voyage. And not one of us on this campus, and I speak with some confidence on this matter, not one of us hasn't torn off their academic regalia at the end of the commencement exercises to get down with the uber funkiness of chameleon. You have to only see it across the campus, everybody throwing their gowns off and boogieing all around this campus. <laughs> In his autobiography, Miles Davis wrote of Herbie Hancock's playing with his characteristic expressive phrasing, which might offend some of you, but I don't mess with Miles. Of Herbie, My of Herbie Miles wrote, the shit sounded good as a motherfucker. Since that is possibly the most popular phrase of my entire introduction, I should say it again. <laughs> the shit sounded as good as a motherfucker. <laughs> See, Herbie was the step after Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk, and I haven't heard anybody yet who has come after him. Ladies and gentlemen, Herbie Hank. Thank you, homie, for your thoughtful and generous introduction. And my heartfelt thanks to you, President Faust, and the entire Norton Committee for making this lecture series a possibility. It's an ultimate honor and a supreme privilege to be selected for the 2014 Charles Eliot Norton Professorship in Poetry, joining the illustrious list of creative seminal writers, poets, artists, scholars, and musicians who have received this designation over the past almost 90 years is indeed a humbling experience. And I look forward to encouraging and engaging in spirited discussions and debate among the students and audience members in attendance. And I thank all of you for joining me this afternoon for my inaugural lecture. When I began the process of 
crafting this opening lecture, it reminded me of putting together Taken Off, my very first record. I wrote down everything I could think of because I had a subconscious feeling that it would be my last record. <laughs> so I tried to throw everything in there. But my friend, the late trumpet player Donald Byrd, wisely said, don't do that. Don't try to throw everything into the first record because you'll have many more. So I'm following his very wise advice this afternoon. Over the course of the next few weeks, I'd like to share a variety of my experiences and some conclusions I've drawn over the past six decades. Ideas and concepts that have helped me in all facets of my life. But before I begin this six lecture journey we're taking together, I'd like to introduce myself to you in my words through my own eyes. My full name is Herbert Jeffrey Hancock. And I was named after the American singer and actor Herb Jeffries. I'm a musician. That's not all. I'm also a spouse, a father, a teacher, friend, Buddhist, American, world citizen, peace advocate, UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador, the chairman of the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz. But what is the single factor that connects all those aspects of me? It's the fact that I'm a human being. This last delineation may seem obvious, but it's, it's no small thing. In fact, it's all encompassing. Let me explain why I think it's important. Most people define themselves by the one or possibly two things they excel at and are recognized for, perhaps a job or a hobby. There's a tendency to live inside these self-made walls and not be open to the myriad opportunities that are waiting on the other side of the fortress. In our society, our external environment seems to encourage and feed this one-dimensional thought process by responding positively in support of this framework we create in our minds. To develop wisdom that will turn on that legendary light bulb and foster creativity in every aspect of life it's essential to first entertain the idea of being open to possibilities. Second, explore how you perceive yourself. And then, third, recognize and investigate opportunities that lie outside of your comfort zone. When you're receptive to the idea of multidimensional thinking or uncovering your infinite potential, don't be quick don't be too quick to say, no thanks, I'm not interested. Because that keeps you locked out of adventures and wisdom which not only help you grow, but positively trickles down to your friends, family, and community. Albert Einstein said, one should not pursue goals that are easily achieved. One must develop an instinct for what one can just barely achieve through one's greatest efforts. Had I not been introduced to the idea of infinite potential 41 years ago through my faith, and it took more than two decades until I saw myself as a human being and not just as a musician, I most likely would have understood and perceived that being a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador was meant as a special award or a support system for playing my music around the world. Because I had this epiphany in the perception of myself as a multidimensional thinker, it led to UNESCO's perception of me in a broader framework than just being a musician. And consequently, 
when they asked if I might be interested in, in a possible appointment as a goodwill ambassador, I jumped at the chance. I've welcomed the opportunity to embrace and cultivate UNESCO's goals of creating peace through education, science, and culture, and have employed intercultural dialogue, music, and other humanitarian efforts to encourage the enrichment of our communal existence. Throughout these lectures, I'll tell you stories about my life in jazz, discuss my life outside of jazz, and the path I've taken that has led me here to this very stage. So, about the title of my lecture series, The Ethics of Jazz. Maybe some of you never thought about jazz having ethics. But first, let's examine what are ethics? The consensus, because there may be varying views, is ethics is a system of morals, the study of right and wrong, good and bad, the wise and empathetic, and how we use our power to protect the rights and self-respect of all people. It's how we behave in the world among society, our brothers and sisters, and the values we hold dear that enable us to collaborate and interact with curiosity, compassion, and righteousness. Without a moral code, the world would be overflowing with selfishness, apathy, greed, cruelty, environmental problems, <laughs> violence, <laughs> well, even with the majority of the world's citizens wanting to make a difference and contribute to a higher purpose, the planet is on a slippery slope. Widespread hunger, wars, poverty, global warming, and other environmental crises, neocolonialism, shameless consumption, sexism, and racism run rampant throughout societies. Whether we are Native Americans, African Americans, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, Northerners, Southerners, Asians, or Australians, we all need and want to create ethical societies. So, now, what are the ethics of jazz? I've uncovered practical lessons and learned that the essential values in jazz and the values of Buddhism are similar and apply to my life on every level. Throughout my lectures, I'll be interweaving and connecting those ideas. And now let's get into the title of this first lecture, The Wisdom of Miles Davis. Sounds like I'm talking about some great sage. Well, in a way I am. The first time I met Miles, I was introduced to him by one of my mentors, the brilliant musician Donald Byrd, who played a significant role in the early days of my career. Not only was he responsible for me getting my first recording contract, but he was an astute businessman who helped me start my own publishing company and shared some secrets about playing. Around Christmas time, right after I graduated from college, a local club owner in Chicago introduced me to Donald Byrd and Pepper Adams, who needed a fill-in for their piano player who was stranded in a blizzard. Unfortunately, that very same storm made it impossible for us to drive to Milwaukee for the gig. But we were able to get to a small jazz club's jam session so they could hear me play. So I sat in, and I was really bad. <laughs> but <laughs> instead of freaking out, I had the courage to walk over to the table, thank them for the opportunity, even though I knew they wouldn't want to take me at that point. But Donald said, what are you talking about? You're coming with us tomorrow. I factored in that you were probably nervous. When we got to Milwaukee, I spent three challenging nights playing with the band and was invited to join as a permanent member. 
But first I had to tell Donald, you have to ask my mother. <laughs> so he did. And this was the beginning of my professional career. When we finished the gig, I headed up to New York City to start the next chapter of my life. And it was Donald Byrd who introduced me to Miles Davis in 1962. One afternoon, we drove over to Miles' house and Miles said, play something. <laughs> he was a man of few words, but he sure knew how to listen. I was so scared, my whole body was trembling. My hands were literally shaking. So I decided I better play a ballad. I played Stella by Starlight. And Miles had one comment. Nice touch. That was it. So I went back to the Bronx to live my life, meanwhile being thrilled that Miles gave me that compliment. Nice touch. And that brought back some memories. Years before I met Miles, a wonderful, wise, and soulful mentor named Mrs. Jordan, my second piano teacher, who taught me piano when I was nine years old, shaped my passion for music. I remember being asked to play a piece for her. She praised me for my reading of the music, but let me know my hands were terrible. And she said, I'd like to play something for you. She then sat down at the piano to play Chopin and blew my mind because she had this touch and this incredible feeling in her playing that moved me in a way that I hadn't experienced before. It was a pivotal moment of inspiration and revelation in my musical life. From that moment on, I wanted to learn to play with passion and develop a nice touch. She taught me how to sit at the instrument properly, meaning my posture, the placement of my feet, when and how to breathe, and more. She also taught me valuable lessons using references from life to transmit an awakening in me about the importance of feeling and touch. These were integral in the path toward becoming one with my instrument. So I should have silently thanked Mrs. Jordan when Miles made his nice touch comment to me after I played my ballad. Now when you hear Miles play his trumpet or my friend Wayne Shorter play his sax, what you hear is not just the sound of a trumpet and a saxophone. You hear Miles, you hear Wayne. And at that level, the instruments are almost superfluous. Sometimes our creativity can be flowing, but I'm sure that many of us have experienced periods when there has been some kind of blockage to our imagination. Many, many years ago, I was challenged and frustrated with my own playing and as a result became a bit depressed. It's disheartening, right? I seem to be playing the same stuff over and over again. I was stuck in familiarity and somehow couldn't get out of the rut. This happened one night at Lenny's on the Turnpike, a well-known jazz club in Peabody about a half an hour or so from here. I was on stage with the Miles Davis Quintet, which included Ron Carter, Tony Williams, and Wayne Shorter. I was really in a, nut, in a rut that night. Everything I played sounded the same. Miles could sense my sense of frustration, so he leaned over to me and said, don't play the butter notes. The butter notes? <laughs> what could he possibly mean? But since it came from Miles, I knew it had to mean something. 
So I figured that he meant don't play the obvious notes because I was thinking butter might mean fat and fat might mean obvious. <laughs> you know? Doesn't apply to the body, so don't worry about it. The most obvious notes might be the third and seventh of a chord because they define the nature of the chord. I realized if I left out the third and seventh notes, I'd have a, a lot of other notes that could work without confining my solos to the obvious restricted interpretation. This would allow the harmonies to be opened up to various views. So I'm gonna uh, show you what I mean by that. In a way, music is like math. So if you're playing a scale, this is one. That's three, that's five. And this is seven, that's a major seventh, and that's a, a dominant seventh. So the third is whether it's minor or major. And the seventh can tell you whether it might go here, or it might be place where you might end up. So in a song, let's take something that might be in what we say D minor. Um, the old way of thinking that got me into a rut was thinking, um, being used to having the third and the seventh in a, in a chord. Okay. Now, if you leave out the third, that's this note, and the seventh, you have these other notes that you can play. So it just gives you more possibilities of things you could play. So that kind of freed me from uh, uh, just being kind of stuck in and just playing. Now, I didn't throw away playing that way. But I included something brand new for me at the time. So even though when I played the next solo, it felt cumbersome and sounded erratic, to my surprise, the audience responded positively and gave me excellent feedback. I believe within this raw exploration, they felt my openness and my desire to try something imaginative. I used Miles's suggestion as an exercise, and this experience became groundbreaking for me and opened the doorway to the future of my performances. Not only did it affect my style of playing throughout the rest of my life, it taught me the valuable lessons of courage, conviction, confidence, and trust. Ethics. Miles could feel my frustration and through his compassion for me and his respect for my feelings, 
he made the wisest of comments. Only a great master can provide a path to finding your own true answers. I was then able to translate Miles' guidance to my future bandmates and students. Reach up while reaching down. Grow while helping others. While we're in the process of moving forward, bring others with you. This mentor-apprentice relationship runs freely through the jazz world. We don't hide our discoveries from other musicians. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's not unusual to hear a musician say, hey, I found this scale that's really cool, or check out the voicing for this chord. That's the spirit and the wisdom of Miles Davis and the ethics of jazz. So always remember, don't play the butter notes. <laughs> In the springtime of 1963, a year after I met Miles, he called me up wondering if I was working with anybody and asked me to come to his house the next day on West 77th Street near Riverside Park in Manhattan. I perceived this as an audition opportunity and heading down to the basement of Miles' house, I saw bassist Ron Carter and saxophonist George Coleman, who had already started working with Miles and drummer Tony Williams, who like me, had just been called by Miles. Sitting on the piano was some handwritten music that I, I didn't know. And uh, Miles played with us a little, then threw his horn on the couch, told Ron to take over and ran upstairs. We played, we talked. Miles came back down and told us to come back tomorrow, which we did for the next two days, playing and conversing. When Miles did join us, he rarely spoke, and he played very little. But on the last day, he told us we were going to meet at Columbia Recording Studio the next day at 3.30 PM. <laughs> and my eyes lit up like a bonfire on the beach. And I said, does that mean I'm in the band? And Miles said with a slight twinkle in his eye, you're making that record, motherfucker. <laughs> I was completely filled with elation. <laughs> and the next day, we all met at the studio and recorded an album you might know, Seven Steps to Heaven. By the way, when Miles ran upstairs doing what I felt was an audition at his house, I found out around 20 years later that Miles went upstairs and actually listened to us through the intercom system in his bedroom. <laughs> he knew his presence in front of us, the new musicians, would have been intimidating, and he wanted to be able to hear, hear us play unencumbered. Now, that's the wisdom of Miles Davis. But before I could officially join the band, I had one last gig to play with a small group led by trumpeter Clark Terry. We were the backup group for Judy Hensky, once known as the queen of the beatniks, a lounge singer of bawdy blues and backroom ballads. And believe it or not, we were the opening act for comedian Woody Allen. <laughs> and yes, in case you're wondering, Woody Allen was full of angst backstage <laughs> and thought the audience hated him even though they were screaming with amusement. We played for a while and towards the middle of the gig, Miles showed up, but, but hid quietly in the shadows. After we finished our set, 
just as I was walking towards the exit door of the club, Miles offered me a ride home in his Maserati. <laughs> Since I had just purchased a new sports car, I told Miles I'd love to ride with him, but I had my new car outside. And Miles said, but it ain't a Maserati. <laughs> and I replied, I know, I know. Meanwhile, we were already on the deserted street right in front of my car, and Miles looked at me and said, cute. <laughs> he walked a little further down the block, got into his Maserati, and since it was about four o'clock in the morning, hours after last call, there were almost no cars on the street. So we both happened to meet up at the red stoplight on Sixth Avenue. <laughs> I knew exactly what was gonna happen. <laughs> the light turned green, I floored it. And when I got to the next red light, I stopped, lit up a cigarette, slowly rolled down the window, waited, and Miles soon caught up with me. <laughs> I felt so darn cool right then. <laughs> I had just beaten Miles in his Maserati. Miles quickly rolled down his window and said, what's that? It's an AC Cobra. And he replied, get rid of it. <laughs> Why, I asked. It's too dangerous. <laughs> and then he drove off into the night. <laughs> that was the kind of guy that Miles was. He loved fast cars, boxing, fast women, and oh yeah, yeah, music. Guess what? I still have that AC Cobra. <laughs> it was the sixth one that was ever made. Don't even ask me what it's worth now. Speaking of boxing, Miles had to fight several battles that uh, dealt with racism. In the 1950s, Miles was working at Birdland, an underground jazz club that was located on Broadway near 52nd Street in New York City. It was called Birdland in recognition of saxophonist Charlie Yardbird Parker. Many of you know that. Miles once said, you can tell the history of jazz in four words, Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker. <laughs> Just a few months after Miles released his groundbreaking album, Kind of Blue, that later became one of his professional highlights and the largest selling recording in jazz history. On a hot, steamy, muggy night between shows at Birdland, Miles walked upstairs to escort an attractive blonde woman into a cab and was outside talking to a few people. This was before he lost his voice and there's a lot of speculation concerning how that happened. The popular story alleges he was instructed not to speak for 10 days following throat surgery, but becoming furious with a record company owner or an associate of his. Miles began shouting, or as Miles said, I raised my voice to make a point. <laughs> and from that moment on, he was not able to speak above the legendary hoarse, rasping whisper we know so well. Quite different from his warm, crystal clear trumpet tone. So, getting back to the story. Miles was taking a cigarette break outside Birdland after finishing a, a Voice of America broadcast downstairs and a white policeman walked up and told him to move on. Miles instantly read the scene and since he was a pretty good boxer due to the lessons he was taking, he considered hitting the cop. But instead said, move on for what? I'm working downstairs, pointing to his name on the marquee. By this time, a crowd of 200 was gathering and out of nowhere, a white detective 
clobbered Miles' head repeatedly with his nightstick and drew copious amounts of blood, which later required five stitches. He was arrested, brought to police headquarters, and finally acquitted, but endured months of legal hassles. He expected racism, racist treatment in his native East St. Louis, but not so blatantly and supposedly tolerant New York. Racism takes different and often subtle forms. Two years after I began my piano lessons with Mrs. Jordan, she entered me and I won the Young People's Concert Series contest for piano. And the grand prize was having the opportunity to play Mozart's Piano Concerto Number no. 18 in B flat major, KV 456 with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra at Orchestra Hall, which is now called Symphony Center. However, there was a catch. The postcard I received telling me I was a winner also mentioned that since they could not find the orchestral parts to the concerto, the piece I knew so well, I'd have to learn a new piece or forfeit my prize playing it with the Chicago Symphony. It sounded awful strange to me, and also to Mrs. Jordan. But I practiced and learned a new concerto, Mozart's Piano Concerto Number no. 26 in D major, the Coronation Concerto. And I felt I was ready to perform it with the symphony. <laughs> was I scared? Heck yeah. But after the performance was over, I was very relieved, and following the show, I signed my very first autograph for a young girl about my age, which was really cool. <laughs> and I was hooked. The next week, as a gift to me, Mrs. Jordan took me to see a renowned classical pianist play with the Chicago Symphony in the same hall. And yes, you might have guessed it, she played the Mozart in B-flat with all the orchestra parts that were supposedly unavailable. We were stunned and mad. Was it just business? I leave it to you to draw your own conclusions. My dear parents, Winnie and Wayman, who came from Georgia, had been faced with rampant racism during their lifetimes and growing up in Chicago. I had a taste of it. From my worldwide travels, I continued to see a large segment of young black men and women with no direct connection to that part of our past which was dark and tragic. And frankly, my generation has failed to adequately pass on the stories of what our ancestors endured and the evolution of freedom for blacks in America. Consequently, there are missing links in the chain. And what discourages me is that this historical chapter was not that long ago. When I read about gangs killing each other, uh, each other over drugs or interpersonal feuds, I can't help but wonder, did our four parents pay the price of slavery for this kind of behavior? It, it's sad. I wonder if experiencing even just one of the 28 West African slave castles, the gates of no return, the last stop, where the slaves were held before they were loaded onto ships and traded in the Americas and the Caribbean, would have had an effect, a profound effect on their behavior. I know it was a sobering and painful experience for me to see some of those slave castles when I was on the island of Gore in Ghana, and in Ghana. The brutality of the African slave trade remains the most immoral and surreptitious holocaust of black men, women, and children in history. And we must never forget the holocaust of nearly wiping out the existence of Native American population and their rich and le legendary culture 
that would have been instrumental in our growth as a nation, and if left intact, would have made indelible marks on society and perhaps been an aid in our quest to solve the problem of climate change. When I was around eight or nine years of age, my father, the guy on, the, on your left, and great-grandfather who's on, on the right, George Garlington, took me to meet an important man. We arrived at an apartment building and walked up the stairs to his apartment, which consisted of one small dark room illuminated muted yellow by only a single light bulb hanging from a, from a cord. After the introductions, I learned he was approximately 90 years old and that when he was a child, he was a slave. I was speechless. It, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And this was a profound moment for me. He remembered shining the boots of a soldier during the Civil War and told me that when he tried to learn to read, he'd be beaten. I also remember a story he told about telling his owner he was going to, he was going out to work in the fields and the owner said, don't say going, say going. It was another shackle, a way to teach ignorance and encourage the impression that blacks were dumb, a cowardly attempt to break this child's spirit. A slave owner's conniving words that were used as a threat and a weapon. In Buddhism, we believe that if any one of us has the ability to commit heinous crimes, we are all capable of this kind of horrific behavior. Often what motivates people toward evil is a distorted view of the reality of life and the relationship between ourselves and the external environment. Coupled with one's own sense of powerlessness, insecurity, and the feeling of the lack of self-worth. But the slaves turn those feelings brought on by oppression and, and inhumanity into beauty, into the blues, jazz, and popular music which spawned rock and roll and the most in-demand commercial music on the planet today, hip hop. Black culture became a primary source of the creation of American culture and a huge influence on international culture. However, we can all contribute to, the elev to elevating the consciousness of humankind. Results may not be immediate, but on an individual basis, you may see positive outcomes quickly before you know it. Being a Nichiren Buddhist, an SGI member, means to believe that all people have the Buddha nature or already have the potential of being awakened to their own infinite potential, their greatness, and recognize the greatness of others as human beings. Many of us have a tendency to think that the ultimate goal of the good life is happiness resulting from having a spouse, a car, the house, the money, the void of problems or challenges, a life of ease. Sounds pretty good, right? But this is not what happiness is about. Happiness is not about getting to the finish line where you have no hurdles, or going to the beach and watch the waves roll in with a rum punch in your hand. Nor can you find the answer to happiness in the thousands of books and audio recordings available for purchase on a box of tea or in a lightly carbonated grape-flavored beverage drink with added tranquility. <laughs> you can't just read about it or pour it into your brain. It's a transformation in your heart that you have to fight for. 
turning your demons into allies. Uncovering an indestructible happiness occurs when you're not afraid of suffering, when you're able to muster the courage to unleash the inner feelings of bring it on, I can do this. I have the confidence to win this fight. We emerge victorious by turning suffering into the driving force for elevating our life condition, transforming our perspective to one that looks for a path for utilizing the suffering to move our lives forward. This is what is known in Buddhism as turning poison into medicine. Think about it. Who are the characters we find most interesting in movies, books, and for that matter, real life? Heroes, like Victor Hugo's Jean Valjean from uh, Les Miserables. Martin Luther King Jr. Helen Keller. Christopher Reeve. Malala Yousafzai, Nelson Mandela. We invest our time and effort in individuals who look conflict in the eye and embrace the struggle because they are riveting, multidimensional, and offer us opportunities to learn from their experiences. Struggles can take on many forms, and I've had a few even as a teenager. Jazz walked into my life when I was 14 years old. Before that age, I thought it was my parents' music. But something hit me during a student variety show at Hyde Park High School in Chicago, during a trio performance, you know, piano, bass, and drums, and the student pianist, Don Goldberg, a class member was improvising on my instrument. Wow, I had no idea how to do that. I didn't quite understand it, but I, I liked what I heard, and so did the other kids in the school. Asking Don for advice after the show, he suggested I listen to George Shearing records. So the minute I got home from school that day, I begged my mother for the records, and she reminded me they were already in my record cabinet. <laughs> Records I never listened to. <laughs> so this time I listened, appreciated what I heard, and tried to copy parts of I Remember April and A Nightingale Sang in Barclay Square. Hooked again. When I entered Grinnell College, my first major was not music. It was electrical engineering. I love science and math, and to this day, I'm known as the gadget guy. <laughs> and this course of study was a practical decision since expecting to have a career in jazz was, that was way too iffy. Now, Grinnell is a small liberal arts college in Iowa, and when I was there in the late 1950s, there weren't a whole lot of jazz musicians in the school. <laughs> However, when I was a sophomore, I decided I was gonna produce a jazz concert for the students. I was able to assemble a 15-piece band, borrowed records, and figured out the arrangement for different songs, and you know, Shiny Stockings was one, uh, a Count Basie recording, which, by the way, was inspiration for Dolphin Dance on my record, Maiden Voyage. I also borrowed arrangements from the University of Iowa and found a few other pieces at Iowa State. I spent most of my time rehearsing the band for the concert instead of going to my classes. So, I knew I had to ace my finals in order to pass. And I did, except for one B. After the concert, 
I went back to my dorm room, looked in the mirror, and asked myself, who was I trying to kid? The very next day, I changed my major from engineering to music and graduated with a BA in music composition. Upon leaving school, I returned home, resumed my job with the post office, and also got a great gig playing with Coleman Hawkins, a legendary pioneer on the tenor saxophone. Miles Davis said, when I heard Hawk, I learned to play ballads. The gig with Hawk was strenuous and lasted 14 straight days, no days off. Four sets a night, five sets on Sunday, and a Sunday breakfast show. <laughs> I was bone tired working both jobs and getting sick with a fever. So after three days, I quit the post office and I was, as I was walking out the door, the supervisor, Mr. Bishop, called out to me, you're gonna regret this someday, Hancock. <laughs> it, was the first time I realized something about real commitment. There was no plan B. Hidden deep in the recesses of my studio, I recently found a tape recording of my Grinnell jazz concert and a photo I'd like to show you. The recording is amateurish. Yeah, you see me on the left? A little guy? Yeah. The recording is amateurish, but would you like to hear some of it? I also wrote out the solo for the saxophone player. <laughs> Those kind of things, that's what took my time. That's why I wasn't going to my classes. <laughs> for all you classical musicians in the audience. <laughs> For all you classical musicians in the audience, embracing jazz is not like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. <laughs> as amateurish as it sounds, it only took me three years to get that far. And I hope you enjoyed listening to it. I learned about the importance of listening from Miles Davis, who once said, I always listen to what I can leave out. Maybe, much to your surprise, he was generous and big-hearted, open to listening to the younger, less experienced members of his band. Miles' behavior was often misinterpreted. For example, most people now think that Miles often disrespected his audience by turning his back to them while he was playing. The truth is, I never saw him do that ever. I saw him facing the band, the way any conductor is expected to do in order to make the music better. That behavior is the opposite of disrespect. He also learned from us. It's an approach I take when working with the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz Fellows, 
who study at the Herb Alpert School of Music at UCLA, where I'm a professor. I listen to their ideas and, and often get inspired by them. One thing I've learned is to always be a student, especially a student of life, and learn to listen and not just seek to be the center of attention. The classroom of Miles Davis was potent, intoxicating, electrifying, and stimulating. And his influence lives and shines brightly in my heart, body, and soul beyond his death and the years I was a member of his quintet. One vital lesson happened when the band was in Stockholm, Sweden, performing in a gigantic arena. This particular night, back in 1967, was absolutely magical, and the audience was wrapped with excitement. The band was hot. We were commuting, communicating almost telepathically. It was like a dream, the kind, the kind of night that every musician hopes for. Suspense and tension were building, the performances were peaking, we were right in the middle of playing Miles' iconic composition, So What? Wayne Shorter had already taken his solo. Tony Williams was firing away on his drums. Ron Carter was smoking. Miles was in the middle of his solo, and it was building and building. And Miles gets to the peak of his solo, and I play this chord, and it is 100% completely, entirely wrong. the wrong chord. <laughs> it was so, so wrong. <laughs> I believed I had utterly destroyed the evening like a house of cards. <laughs> and I knocked them all down. In an instant, time stood still. I was shocked and I felt totally shattered. Oh no. You know what happened next? Miles took a breath and played this phrase that made my chord right. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe it. How did he do that? Was it some kind of magic potion or spell? Was I hypnotized? How could he turn a wrong chord into a right chord. It didn't seem possible. It took me years to figure out what transpired. Miles didn't hear what I played as a wrong chord. He merely heard it as an unexpected chord. He didn't judge it. I did. Miles took it upon himself to do what jazz musicians always hope to do and that is to make whatever happens work. And we all should be doing that throughout our lives. As musicians, we improvise. Miles didn't judge what I played. He turned poison into medicine. He taught me a great lesson but I didn't realize how it applied to life until I began practicing Buddhism. And then I finally understood that life events, good or bad, have the potential for being learning experiences. But if they're not perceived that way, if you're not open to that perspective, the lesson is invisible and thus potentially lost. Keep your eyes peeled, your ears open, your senses sharp, feelers receptive, and develop the wisdom to perceive the lesson. Perhaps you've heard the expression, there are no wrong notes. What happened to me that night with Miles was not just an idiomatic phrase, a visceral experience. 
To this very day, it affects the way I look at my performances from moment to moment, both as a soloist and accompanist. Thelonious Monk cleverly said, there are no wrong notes, just better choices. <laughs> and he also said, the loudest noise in the world is silence. And consequently, one of the lessons I learned is to always take whatever happens, nourish it, and help it flourish. And if you really pay attention, sometimes that happens through silence. Doing nothing can sometimes be doing a great deal in disguise. Silence is a vital component of music. It's as powerful as the surrounding notes. And silence is a critical life skill. Actually, think about how much of our lives are gestures or allow others to ponder and draw their own conclusions. A person of wisdom knows how to provide that kind of space, the sounds of silence. One can also find silence in literature, design, and architecture. Architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe famously said, less is more. And I think we can all agree he was on to something important, not just in his buildings, but in a philosophy of life. Before we get to the q and I'm going to close this lecture with a story about my father, Wayman Hancock. During my high school years in 1956, I was thrilled to get a job at a neighborhood mom and pop grocery store within walking distance from my home. On the second day of my employment, the owner told me he was going to show me something after he closed up the shop for the evening. He locked the door and then instructed me how to pull a certain lever on the cash register that would not register on the receipt. He was asking me to cheat, to steal, to defraud the poor people that I knew in the neighborhood. This was inconscionable to me because I was never the kind of person who could swindle people. However, I felt conflicted, confused, and discouraged. Even so, the next day I <laughs> feebly gave his scheme a, a try and completely screwed up in the process. I failed at carrying out that scam. I went home that evening and told my father about it and let him know that if I didn't cheat on the receipts, the owner said he would fire me. And so I want, since I wanted to keep my job, I was at a loss as to what to do, how to proceed. My father's succinct advice was, well, son, you'll have to figure that one out for yourself. I went back into the store the next day and quit. Afraid that my father would be angry about me quitting my job, I arrived back home and told him what I did. And you know what he said to me? He said, son, I'm proud of you. Leaving the decision on my shoulders was the wisest of choices. Reinforced his belief in me and buoyed my own self-confidence. The sound of his silence was loud and clear. And now it's time for me to embrace the silence, listen to and learn from your questions and comments, and thank all of you for spending this time with me and, and listening to my stories. It's been an honor. Thank you.